All right. Hi, I'm Sophie. I work at Red Hat as a software engineer, and I'm part of a team whose focus is on designing intelligent applications to run in containers on the cloud. Now, when I say intelligent applications, what I mean is applications which use machine learning or artificial intelligence. Merely nine months ago, I lived a very different life as a PhD student. Um, I spent four years at the University of Bristol getting a PhD from the Department of Mathematics. There is a screenshot of the front cover of my thesis as proof. My PhD was based in the statistics group, and it focused on making inference for complex models, represented here by this gray box. Maybe it's not so gray anymore. Um, so we were working in the big data regime in the sense that these models took in high dimensional parameters and spat out high dimensional data. Most of the models we were working with were of complex ecological systems, and I spent a lot of time working with a model of everybody's favorite animal, the earthworm. So on the surface, my work here in industry is the same as it used to be. I'm still doing statistics and programming. I still have weekly meetings with a mentor, and I still power my days with coffee. But what I want to talk to you about in the next 15 minutes is what's different, what lives in the gray section of that Venn diagram. Now, a sensible question to ask yourself at this point is, why should you care? Well, who here is a grad student or has recently graduated? So this could be you and not so long. And even if you do decide to stay in academia, you'll probably have to liaise with industry at some point. So it's important to understand where they're coming from. Everyone else, well, it doesn't take a statistician to tell you that it's highly likely that you will, at some point in your career, work with someone who is or was a grad student. So hopefully you can gain insight into where they're coming from and how you can support them as they turn up on day one at your office's door. So to structure my talk, we'll look at three objectives. For both academia and industry, we'll begin by talking about the goals of the work. What are the notable aims and achievements? We'll then look at what drives the work or what's the incentive. And finally, we'll look at some barriers to progress in both academia and in industry. So let's dive in and think about goals. Now, important to think about, in order to think about goals, it helps us to have a specific task in mind. And the task I want you to think about is building a recommendation engine from what film we should watch tonight after we've gone out for dinner to who we should follow on social media. Many of today's most engaging and commercially important applications are providing personalized experiences to users, and they're able to make personalized recommendations quickly and efficiently. And in fact, I've spent some, some of my time here at Red Hat working on building a recommendation engine. But what we're going to think about the task as now is uh, recommendation engines from the point of academia. Now, in academia, the goal is publications. And in order to get a publication, you've got to do something that no one else has done before. One of the leading algorithms for recommendation engines is alternating least squares. And if I do a Google Scholar search for papers on alternating least squares and just look at the papers this year already, there's already over 3,300 of them. So doing something new isn't an easy feat. But if I was going to, I'd probably set off by following this little flowchart here. And at some point, I'd stop and I'd say, OK, I've done better than what came before. How would I know that I'd done better? Well, I'd probably run my algorithm on a static data set that someone else had run their algorithm on in their paper, and I'd show that I've got some reduction of error. Great, got myself a publication. So let's take such a paper, such an algorithm, and put it into production. Now, the algorithm we're going to use improves on previous algorithms by accounting for temporal effects. And it's legitimate, it's real, it's cited by 4,416 people when I took this data, probably more by now. In order to implement it, we're going to need some data. So the data we're going to use is the Movie Lens Project data. So this was collected by uh, the Group Lens Research Group at the University of Minnesota. And the key point is that there's 26 million ratings in there. So we've got ourselves a lot of data. As the name suggests, this is ratings that users have made about films. So let's pretend that I'm the customer and we're building this recommendation to give me a suggestion for what film I should watch. Now, I've actually rated over 100 films, but I'm just showing you a snippet here so you can see what I like. In general, I like kids' films and I dislike scary movies. 
So in this next cell, I'm appending the ratings that I made to the 26 million ratings in that movie lens data set. And then in the final cell, I go ahead and I build a model. Now, you'll have to take my word for it that those three parameters, rank, iterations, and lambda, have been selected optimally. So let's talk more about that last line where we build a model. This ALS train function implements the algorithm in that paper that I showed you earlier. But this isn't code I wrote. I'm using an off-the-shelf implementation. And this, to me, was the first huge difference between research and production. The idea of using some code that someone else has written was not something that I'd done or been encouraged to do throughout my PhD, and yet it brings so many advantages. So this code is tried and tested, and it does what it says it will, because loads of other people have used it first. When I went to write up my thesis, I had to rerun some code that I had written in my second year. And you know, I submitted this to conferences and put in papers. And all of a sudden, I figure out that this code isn't doing what I thought it was. And yeah, it's code that I'd written. But that's not going to happen here. This code is robust. <laughs> So I'm coding in Python here, and this code lives in the PySpark MLlib recommendation and, um, package. So that's Apache Spark and Python. Spark's designed for scale out over a large cluster, and in fact, it sort of does all of the work for you. So within reason, you don't have to worry about the scaling. What happens on a basic level is that the driver program sends off the work to these individual workers known as Spark executors, and it runs the task, and then it returns the output to the driver node. So this allows data to be analyzed in parallel, and it doesn't take any overhead from me. I don't really need to know what's going on. And that also came as a huge shock. I'd done some parallel computing during my PhD, and in general, I'd coded something up in a day or so, and then I'd spend about six months debugging it. So Apache Spark really gives us this scaling power, and it wasn't something that I'd even heard of until I turned up in industry. And the recommendation engine code now runs quickly, even on that 26 million ratings data set. So I always thought I was working with big data when I was doing my PhD. But in practice, I always knew how much data there was, and it could all be processed on one computer, even if it meant that I just had to leave it running for the weekend or go and have a few extra coffees. So I'd never really appreciated that truly big data is big. So let's head back to the recommendation engine and get some ratings. So in this first line, I ask the model that we built using that tried and tested algorithm to give predictions for all the films that I have not seen. And in the second line, I ask for the top 10 recommendations for me to be returned. Now, unless Eros plus Massacre is some Disney film that I just haven't heard of, these recommendations don't look so good. So this isn't going to fly in production. But that algorithm is published. It has lots of citations, and they're positive citations. It's not people saying this doesn't work. And I trained it at optimal parameter values. So what's gone wrong? Well, the third number in every triplet here is how many people rated those films. So you can see for the top rated film for myself, only one other person, one person in that whole 26 million rated it. Now, their opinions on the films that I rated must have coincided with my opinions but they also rated this film highly, and so it's suggested to me. And thus, our well-cited published algorithm is failing. We don't want this in production. So that brings us nicely onto industry goals. The goal here is to build a recommendation engine that works, where works means improves the overall performance of our application by helping us meet some business objectives. There's going to be some metric that we're optimizing for, but it's not mean squared error of the parameters of the model, for example. So what we're missing right now is the sensible recommendations. And it turns out all we have to do to get these is filter out films that have a low number of votes. So I have filtered out films that have been rated by fewer than 500 people, and all of a sudden, these recommendations look much better. Now, that filtering process isn't amending alternating least squares. It's not novel. Tons of people have done it before me. And it's not going to get me a publication or win me a research prize. But it works. I could ship this. OK, so let's talk briefly about personal incentives. When I started my PhD, my main motivation was to be a world-class researcher. I wanted my name in lights. I wanted citations coming out of my ears. I wanted it all. 
That quickly fizzled away, and the next year or so, I wanted to be a reasonable PhD student. And sadly, over time, that quickly fizzled away in uh, getting a job, getting a PhD so that I could go and get a job. So my personal incentives were driven by my supervisor's incentives. But in general, what I do doesn't affect him. He's already got more PhD students filling the place that I left behind. Um, so it's generally just me striving to get that PhD. Now, when I first rolled up at industry after grad school, the main incentive was being paid money. That quickly changed. Um, I want to do work that my company and my team are proud of. Why? Well, for one, that makes me feel good. And arguably, that's the same in research. But here, there's a much bigger picture. By helping my team achieve goals, um, I feel valued and I feel spurred on to do better. So working as part of a team was by no means unexpected to me, but it was much more of an adjustment than I imagined. I found it very difficult to know whether I'm asking for too much help, not enough help, whether I should work on my own, whether I should collaborate. And communicating what I do is now of vital importance. When I was a grad student, everyone had some vague idea of what I did, but no one really knows the details. All of a sudden, not only does my team need to know what I'm doing, but they actually care, I think. OK, so uh, in the last couple of minutes, let's talk about some boundaries to progress in both sittings. Um, I think this follows on nicely from Lars's talk earlier. If he's still around, um, he talked about some common pitfalls that we might fall into. So I feel like constraints, uh, the main constraint in both settings is time. So long gone are the days of spending 10 years doing your PhD. In the UK, if you do not hand in your PhD thesis within four years, you automatically fail. But finish doesn't really mean finished. The last chapter of my thesis was entitled Further Work. And there's already a PhD student sat in my desk picking up where I left off, so it's fine. Furthermore, if I decided that I wanted to spend a month thinking about something completely pointless but vaguely mathematical, everyone was happy with that. It didn't add to my thesis, but that was cool. With that in mind, I think your incentives and your goals have to be stronger in academia in order to drive you forward. In production, the notion of deadlines are more frequent and much more con concrete, particularly if we're working towards a release date or a customer's timeline. But I'm never the last person to work on a project. And with that in mind, I've got to think more about how I spend my time. So could I use my statistics background to get an incremental improvement in that recommendation engine if I spent the next 10 hours, 10 days, 10 months working on it? Yeah, definitely. But is that worthwhile, given that we've got something that works? Probably not. So I have to think more about when to stop in production. How done is done. Now, we touched on the size of data sets when we talked about scaling out using Apache Spark, but something I hadn't appreciated is how difficult it is to actually get decent data for training and development. So in research, the data had always been handed to me. It was data that someone else had used in their paper. I wanted to run my algorithm on that exact same data set to show that I did better or compare my results. But in production, I want to make things that are new and real, so I need real data, and it's just not there for the taking. The only time, um, the first time I was handed a data set in my new job, um, it had not been cleaned, and I had not appreciated that data cleansing was even a thing. Um, but I got this data set, it was huge, and uh, it was a CSV, and I thought, well, I've got a PhD, it's separated by commas, how hard can it be? <sighs> so, on that note, if you are a grad student, um, I hope that you're prepared to stand on the shoulders of giants, use code that already exists, and don't try to reinvent the wheel. And keep your goals in mind, because they're going to drive you. If you're in industry, please be open to being asked for help. Um, don't see it as a sign of weakness. You, a lot of people potentially think that grad students know it all, but actually we know very little. Um, we know something very detailed about a very minor thing. Um, but we do have many great skills, so please exploit those and turn us into great co-workers. So you can find me on Twitter, that's my email address, and this URL down here is where we keep all of the information about the recommendation engine that my team built. Thank you very much, Sophie.